Amen. That was a great reminder, wasn't it? And uh, I know for myself, I can't help but sit there and think of uh, all that God's done. And uh, often we think of what we don't have, and uh, we don't have to look very far to see what we do have. If we focused more of our time uh, on praising God instead of um, desiring, coveting, and look at un- looking at others and comparing ourselves uh, to others, we would probably find, no doubt, we would find more satisfaction in life when we look to Christ and all that he's done for us. Amen. Turn your Bibles to Matthew, Matthew chapter number 13. Matthew chapter number 13. I hesitate to even say this because whenever I say that I'm going to do this, it never works out. Because Sunday mornings, I like to allow myself to be maybe uh, a little bit more, give myself a little bit more liberty instead of preaching a series because often uh, the Lord may put something on my heart or change my message. But I'm praying about uh, um, continuing from today on a series on the parables of Christ. And here we find when he begins to teach in parables, he gives us the parable of the sower. How many of you have heard the parable of the sower before? You're familiar with the parable of the sower. And there's certain uh, facets, facets or aspects of this parable that we can choose to focus on. But we're going to look at this as a, a whole uh, of this morning, not just in the way that Jesus taught as he began this way of ministry, but why he taught this way, and then as well, what the interpretation, understanding, or, or meaning of this parable that he used to teach uh, was, and I don't want to allow our familiarity with this text to keep us uh, from getting what God has for us this morning, each of us uh, as individuals. Uh, Matthew chapter 13, we're going to start off just by reading the first nine verses. It says, the same day when Jesus, uh, now the same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside. The fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon the stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them, and others fell into the good ground, brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear? Let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? This parable is recorded for us not only here in Matthew, uh, but as well as in the book of Mark and in the book of Luke. And we understand Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, are different as Gospels in comparison to the Gospel of John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what's called the synoptic Gospels. Uh, the word synoptic simply means to see together. They give a, a similar perspective or viewpoint in uh, many of the same things are recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And when they are, they're recorded very factually. Uh, as to this is what Jesus did. Now, we know there's the fourth gospel, John, focuses not just simply on what Jesus did, but who Jesus was. And if you know your Bible, when you look in John chapter number one, that's how the book of John begins. So these uh, particular, uh, this particular and several of the particular uh, kingdom parables are recorded not only in Matthew, but in Mark and Luke uh, as well. And uh, this is part of and it's, some would divide these parables uh, differently, but uh, I would say 14 different kingdom parables that are recorded for us in the book of Matthew. Now, some of those are recorded as well in the book of Mark, and some of those are, as well are recorded in Luke, and this is one of those parables that's, uh, uh, that is uh, recorded for us in all three of these Uh, in all three of the synoptic gospels. I'm going to look at three different points this morning, okay? And we're going to look, first of all, at the method of Jesus' teaching. Then we're going to look at the mystery of Jesus' teaching. And then lastly, we're going to look at the meaning of Jesus' teaching. When we talk about the method of teaching, people teach in different ways, don't they? I had somebody tell me recently they went to a, a church and the pastor got up to preach and he, he didn't do much preaching. He just taught and he said, to be honest with you, it was, it was boring. I could hardly stay awake. And uh, 
uh, somebody, I, I, I was waiting for somebody to pipe up and say, were you visiting at the Batavia Baptist Temple? Uh, but uh, nobody said that, so I was glad I had some relief there. But, uh, you know, all of us have different methods of teaching. Uh, God's, are you glad that God's created all of us differently? I tell you this, every day I think when I interact with different people, I am so glad that God did, make, did not make everyone like Pastor Phil Taylor. A lot of days, I have a hard time putting up with myself, uh, more or less uh, imagine how other people put up with me. And the truth is, if you thought the same way, you would probably have the same reaction. Uh, we know ourselves better than anyone else. God's created us all different with different personalities. And so uh, when we see teaching and preaching, we see a vastness of characteristics and, and styles. And that's not what we're talking about this morning. It's not styles or that one person is loud or that one is soft. But what we're talking about is the particular mindset that Jesus had as he was teaching. He did this for a particular reason. Do you believe that Jesus did anything by accident? Is there anything that he did that he didn't do without purpose? And so we want to examine and maybe have a little bit of an understanding of why. So when we look at verses 1 through 9, we see this. It says, the same day went Jesus out of his house. What day was this? We could look back to chapter number 12 and see what was recorded for us. And at the very end of chapter number 12, they come to him and they say that your mother and your brothers are, uh, uh, are here. And you know what he says? He says, who, essentially, who is my mother and who are, who are my brothers? He said, I'm here with my disciples. This is my family. He did not discount that they were not family, but what he did is he essentially put all those who were following him under the same category as being what? His family. These are my brothers. These are my sisters. We see Jesus doing uh, much, and we see the, the Word of God that does much to uh, support and lay the foundation for the nuclear family, and I believe that's important. So this is not undermining the importance of the nuclear family, but what it is doing is uplifting as well the importance of the family of God in those who put their faith and trust in Christ and the relationship that we can have together as believers. The uh, Lord's blessed me with a wonderful family. No one could ever replace that. But alongside that family, God's given me many others that, we can, that I can love and have the opportunity to serve God together with. Uh, it says this same day after this had transpired, Jesus does something specific. It says he went out of the house and he sat by the seaside. I wonder why. The Sea of Galilee is a vast body of water. Anybody ever sit by a lake? Ever go and sit by a body of water? How many of you are looking forward to sometime this summer going and sitting by the ocean someplace? Just looking out, relax a little bit. We've got a few families be leaving for Hawaii soon. They'll be enjoying some of that uh, sunshine and the beautiful waters uh, that are there. They say that the waters of Hawaii can only be compared to that of the Stone Lake Lake, and uh, I, can see the, I can see the comparison between those if you've ever been to both. So, But think about Jesus. Why do you, and we can't know, the Bible doesn't tell us why he went there, does it? It doesn't tell us why he sat down by the sea. Now, did he know what would happen when he went there? Did he? Okay. What are some of your thoughts as to why, after all this transpired, he goes and sits by the seaside? Why, if you were to, or by the, uh, uh, sits by the, by the water, why would, why would you go and sit by the water? Why do you like sitting by the ocean and seeing the waves crashing in? Why do I go and sit down by the river at my house and just kind of watch the ripples come across the water? Many times it's reflective, would you say that? Taking some time to think. Well, what's, a, what's another value of that time when you get away? And often when we get away or we, re, we retreat, for some reason we find ourselves around what? Bodies of water, Sean? Relaxing. It's relaxing. Hey, do you think Jesus needed to reflect? Yeah. Do you think he needed to relax? The Bible tells us he faced all the physical infirmities that we did. He was, he was tired. There's no doubt that he was exhausted from all that had happened. Well, what's another, uh, what's another wonderful aspect of going and, and retreating away and going someplace and reflecting and, and relaxing? Time alone. Peace. Time alone. Peace. Listening. The beauty. Yeah. Well, there's many reasons. Think about, think about Jesus sitting there, taking all of that in. 
He spent his time, not as an individual, but he spent his time with the multitudes. You think he desired, as we do in his human body that he lived in, some time to himself? To reflect, to relax, to be alone? If you have kids, you know what that desire is. (laughs) (laughs) To have just that bit of a retreat. I want us to keep that mindset and understand. I almost fell right there. That would not have been funny. I saw somebody almost fall today who remained nameless, but it was funny. (laughs) They were literally standing still in one place during the song service, and they had some of them big shoes on, you know what I'm talking about? And all of a sudden, their knees just buckled, and they went... (laughs) And I don't know if anybody saw it but me. And I can tell you this, I get to enjoy many things that other people don't get to from up here, and it was quite entertaining. I will not tell you who it was, as tempted as I am right now. But (laughs) it says that when he went out that same day and sat by the seaside, that kind of sets the the scene for us, right? It says, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him. Seeking solidarity, he found himself where? In a crowd of people. This should remind us, you know what ministry is, people? People. I heard a pastor one time say this, the ministry would be great if it wasn't for people. If it wasn't for people, there would be no ministry. I hate to hear people say that. As a matter of fact, I think it's ignorant. I've been surprised by some of the ignorant things that I've heard people say, though. To think that impacting others for the cause of Christ is not even possible without what? Having others that we can impact and influence their lives. So if you've committed yourself to serving God, if you've committed yourself to being, uh, to being faithful in church, to following His will for your life, you know what you're going to find? You're going to find yourself dealing with people. Right. And you're going to find that their burdens become your burdens. And their heartaches become your heartaches. And their hurts become your hurts. Their joys become your joys. And their celebrations become your celebrations. Yes. It's a roller coaster of life when God gives you the opportunity to work with, to minister, and to know others and serve alongside of them. But here he finds himself in a great multitude. It says, they were gathered together unto him so that he went into a ship. Here this is a a resulting action. It says that there was a great multitude, and because of that great multitude, what does he do? He He goes into a ship. Now, This gives the idea, imagine he's trying to relax, he's by himself, he's on the shore, and all of a sudden a great multitude comes, like typically followed him. And they're pressing upon him as we read in other passages. And they're pressing upon him so much he doesn't have anywhere to go, so he he gets somewhat innovative, doesn't he? What does he do? He gets gets into a boat. Where did teaching typically take place? Where at? In the synagogue. Now, they already didn't like Jesus. They wanted to have control of all of the teaching and all that happened. But they were lost in religion. Here here we're reminded that our teaching reaches far beyond what happens within these four walls. It's not about a religion, but it's about a lifestyle. It's about a relationship with Christ. And it pushes him out and he's into the boat. And there's a wonderful statement I love here. You're really going to like it too. It says when he got the boat, he did what? He sat. And then it says what? The people did what? The people stood. The congregation stood, and the pastor sat down. I think we ought to try that sometime. We're going to have all of you stand. You think I preach long now. You let me sit down. There's no telling what may happen. (laughs) Sometimes teaching and preaching doesn't always look like what we expect it to. The greatest influence that people have had in my life, yes, has many times been from a pulpit and wonderful men of God preaching the Word of God. But you know, some of the impacting moments as well have been sitting down together with somebody at a meal, experiencing life together, going places together, doing things 
Listen, those are not a substitute for faithfulness to the house of God, but they're also a part of our lives that allow us to not only be influenced, but to influence others. He finds himself in a boat, and it drove the religious nuts. Imagine them standing around with their arms folded. Who does he think he is? You can't teach on a boat on the Sea of Galilee. You're supposed to go to the synagogue. Some of those may have been independent Baptists if they were around back then. We've never done it that way before. Hey, can I tell you this? Jesus did a lot of things how they never did it before. <laughs> they put him in the tomb, and he was dead. And three days later, he rose again. It wouldn't surprise me if there were some Christians standing around going, oh, well, we've never done it that way before. <laughs> He was, the, he was the one who did things in new ways. Here he's ushering in not only a, a new idea of teaching, but he be, tells us that this was a new way of teaching. He says, then began Jesus to teach in what? In parables. Now, oh, i got, I got to share this because it's in my notes. If it's in my notes, i got to say it. <laughs> if I sat and everybody else stood, it may take care of some of the sleeping problems as well. <laughs> says he began to teach him parables. Why do you think he taught him parables? Now he's going to tell us why. The word parable means to lay alongside. It actually means to throw alongside. A verbiage that even comes to our English language today where we get the idea of throwing a ball, to throw something alongside. What's the definition that you've most often heard of a parable? An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. A spiritual truth, and you throw down beside it what? An example, an illustration, a, a story. Oftentimes in my preaching, I'll use what? A story, an example, an illustration. I heard a, a pastor say one time that you ought not use illustrations in your preaching. Just give the Word of God. Well, he wouldn't have liked the preaching of Jesus then. Because he taught in parables. Why? We find specifically one of the reasons he used parables, parables which we'll look at in a second. But do you think that I believe parables also made him relatable? He talked about the, uh, he talked about, uh, the sower that went out to sow. You know what was all over in that area, in the plains at the, uh, the, the base of the sea there, there's fields. What do you think they were doing in those fields? They were sowing seed. He used an illustration that they could see, that they could understand. Now, in verses 3 through 9, he gives this parable to the crowd. You know what he doesn't give them? Do you know this? I was reminded of this. He doesn't give them the explanation of the parable. All he does is give the crowd the parable. He comes later and gives the explanation to who? We'll read it in just a few moments. He comes later and gives the explanation to his disciples. Hey, the Bible says that which is spiritual is what? Spiritually discerned. And that which is carnal is what? Carnally discerned. The things that are of the flesh and of this world are understood by what? The flesh. And the things that are spiritual are understood by what? The Spirit. Who has the Spirit? We have the Spirit. Believers have the Spirit. Those who put their faith and trust in Christ have the Spirit. Christians have the Spirit. Hey, do you know he's about to put the focus in the meaning as he explains it to his disciples. He's going to put the focus on the gospel. That's what they needed to know. Someone that doesn't know Christ doesn't need a theology lesson. They need the gospel. Amen. Someone who's not saved doesn't need a better understanding of the book of Revelation. They need a better understanding of John 3.16. To, to enter into theological debate with someone who doesn't even have the grounds of the gospel that they've landed on is really vain. Because that which is spiritual is what? Spiritually discerned. For those who are lost, we ought to spend our time giving them the gospel. You know what, what was very revealing? Here, 
And we'll look at it in just a second. This kind of flows into the, these are going to kind of flow together. We're going from the method of the teaching into the mystery of the teaching. Hey, to those that didn't know Christ, this was a mystery. But I thought about this. Why did he give it in a mystery? Well, why did he veil it in secrecy? We'll look at that in just a second, but well, we find that when he ascends, he gives this truth about preaching the gospel to all people, no matter the condition of their heart or the condition of the soil. He gives it very clearly and straightforward, doesn't he? He says to preach it to every creature. One of the fundamental principles of this parable is not that we selectively sow the seed, but that the seed should be sowed where? Everywhere. We don't say that that's hard ground, that's stony ground, that's thorny ground. We're not going to put it there. We're just going to put it on the, on the good ground. It says that the, the sower sowed the seed everywhere. So just as much as he spoke in parables, when he spoke just solely to his disciples, what did he do? He gave it to them clearly. Preach the gospel. It's all nations, kindreds. He says, take the gospel to the entire world. As we think of the mystery of the gospel, verse number 10, it says, The disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto him, unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given, or they don't have spiritual discernment. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance, but whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. You say, well, that's an easy to understand verse right there. We're going to have, that's so easy to understand, we're going to have Micah Cochran stand up right now and give us an explanation of what that verse means. Micah's looking at me like, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Simply put, we can see this to be true. When someone has spiritual discernment and they desire to know the things of God, the things of God will be revealed to them. But those who have no desire to know the things of God and reject it, their heart is hardened to it. It may not receive it. They may not understand it. Verse number 13. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they, seeing, see not. And hearing, they hear not. Neither do they understand. That's a sad verse, isn't it? Have you ever tried to share something that God had done in your heart with somebody that didn't know Christ? And they just looked at you like, uh huh. Oh, that's great. Hey, seeing? Spiritually blind. They hear, but they're, they're spiritually deaf. They don't have any understanding. Verse number 14 says, And in them is fulfilled the, property, the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear. And shall understand, seeing ye shall see, see and not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes, not they're blind. What does it say? They have closed. Is that different? <laughs> Lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. This prophecy, do you know where it's found in Isaiah? Isaiah chapter 6, verses 8 through 10, speaking of Israel. Who was standing around listening? It was the Jews, it was the religious the prophecy of Isaiah was that their, their ears would be, would be uh, deafened, that their eyes would be blinded. The prophecy of Isaiah is that they would hear, but their heart would be what? Hardened. Jesus here explains this to his disciples. He says that he's teaching in parables out of his grace and out of his mercy. Because if he doesn't, their hearts would be hardened even more. The same sun that softens the wax is the sun that hardens the clay. 
And just as a truth revealed to one that has understanding softens the heart and allows somebody to take in that spiritual understanding and knowledge, the same enlightenment or sun that would shine, that would shine upon the hardened heart or that of clay would only cause it to do what? Harden even more. To reject even more. Hey, they had already decided that they were going to reject Jesus. And they already had. They weren't blinded, but they had what? Closed their eyes. That's what the scripture says. Their heart had not been hardened. They had hardened their heart. Religion had hardened their heart. The Pharisees and religious of that day had hardened their hearts. And the preaching of Jesus was sensitive to understanding this. That how he presented the truth would have an effect on everyone who was there. And this parable speaks much to understanding of the free will of man inside of the sovereignty of God. Uh, the, the sovereignty of God is that God can do whatever He wants because He's what? Because He's God. Amen. Let me ask you this question. Think of that in conjunction with the different types of soil. Does it say that the sower went and dropped the seed just into particular places? No, but he, it was every place. So when we consider the sovereignty of God and the free will of man, if God is sovereign, is God sovereign? you believe God's sovereign, say amen. amen. Can he do what he wants because he's God and because he is sovereign? Okay, amen. then can he allow man to have a free will? Amen. We can never believe that sovereignty extends to the point that it limits God and his ability to use the free will of man. Because if he desires to use the free will of man, he can do so because he's God. It doesn't speak, the free will of man doesn't speak against the sovereignty of God, but it speaks for the sovereignty of God. That in his all-knowing power and, and ability to do whatever he wants, if he wants to give man a free will, he can. When did he begin showing us that through his word? How about the book of Genesis? Right. Yeah. When he gives Adam and Eve a what? Free will. To make a choice. Yep. Here, this is focusing upon the gospel and how it's received. Jesus himself is giving the truths in a way, understanding that the very way that he gives it can impact the reception of the one who gets it. Can we give the truth in a way where it could be rejected? How about this? You knock on somebody's door. First of all, they're probably not going to answer anymore. Second of all, if they come to the door, you just say, I've got good news for you. If you were to die right now, you're probably going to go to hell. It, is that true? Look at me, is that true? Yes. If they're without Christ, is that true? Yes. Is that the best way to present the gospel? Or could that <coughs> contribute to the hardening of the heart? Just because it's true, we still, the scripture says, we ought to be what? Wise as serpents and what? Harmless as doves. Oh, we're encouraged to speak the truth in love. Could you knock on someone's door and from a, a heart of love share the gospel with them in such a way that they could be more receptive? The way that we present truth is important. Jesus is telling his disciples that here. He says, hey, I don't want to harden their hearts anymore. But those who want to hear, I want to give them the opportunity to be able to respond. He talks about the blessings of hearing and knowing and understanding the truth in verses 16 and 17. He says, you've got eyes and you see. You have ears and you hear. And because of that, you have understanding. We shouldn't be surprised when a lost world doesn't have understanding of spiritual truth. When we look at somebody and say, God created them male and female. What does that mean to them? Without the knowledge of the gospel. We want people to love our religion and our beliefs, not to love our God and His gospel. But guess what they have to do first before they can understand? Love our God and His gospel. Amen. Uh, hey, can I tell you this? I think that gender confusion is wicked and evil and from the pit of hell. Amen. I believe that. But the root of the problem isn't gender confusion. The root of the problem is people without the gospel. I, uh, 
I think sometimes we want the results, but we don't want the, we want the fruit, but we don't want the root that produces it. The root that produces the right fruit is the one from Psalm chapter number one, right? The tree that's planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Why? Because in his word doth he meditate day and night. Because he doesn't stand in the, in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but in his law doth he delight. Well, if we could understand that truth, I'm as passionate about all those things as anybody else. I hate what I see in the world that we live in. But we need to see the solution as being Christ. Yes. Without Christ, what ideology is, are those things born out of? Besides basic biology, which as well also speaks to those truths, right? But to change the heart. Somebody needs what? The gospel. And that's what he focuses on here. Third, now be done, the meaning of the teaching. He gives him here the direct teaching. He says, those that are by the wayside, in verse number 19, he says, uh, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, or the gospel, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in the heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. So the gospel comes to somebody, and what happens? What does it say here? It says Satan comes and snatches it away. The heart can't receive it. It falls on the, the wayside would be a, a path or someplace maybe where the sower or others would, would walk, and it was trodden down, and so it was a little bit firmer. And uh, I'm no gardener, but I know this, so that if you set seed on top of hard ground, it's not going to grow. It has to penetrate that ground. So before, now, if you leave it lay there long enough, what could happen? The rain could come and soften that ground a little bit. Eventually, that seed could penetrate into the heart, but most often, what happens? It's discarded by some other source or some other reason. Here it says the wicked one. Who's the wicked one? Satan comes and what takes it? This is religion. The truth is there, but we're so lost in religion that we don't accept it and don't receive it. That's right. But listen, it's not only religion, but it's atheism, it's paganism. Uh, two opposite ends of the same spectrum. Satan could use atheism and saying there is no God, and he could use that to snatch that seed away, but he could also just as readily use religion and make you think that you're okay even though you've never accepted Christ and snatch that seed away. Well, we think Satan masquerades all the time around as paganism and atheism and pantheism. And ideas and concepts about God that we know are not biblical. But Satan's greatest tool has always been to be an imitator. Yeah. And what he'll do is come in the form of religion and say, you come to church, you teach a Sunday school class. You've been in church your entire life. Certainly you're saved. Hey, know this. Satan may have come and snatched the seed away. Two opposite ends of the same spectrum. Atheism and religion robbing the heart of man of the seed of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not only do we see the wayside, but in verse 20, it says, but he received the seed into what? Stony places. The same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation and persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by, he is what? Offended. Wow. Tells us that it fell in what? Stony soil. I know something about stony soil. Brother Tony has been at my house with earth moving equipment. And he knows that if you go to the back of my house, that from the back of my house, to the top of the hill is nothing but rock and concrete and fill that was put in there when they uh, tore out old uh, State Route 222 that used to run through there. You go over the hill, 
down by the river, nothing but sand. Beautiful. From the back of my house all the way back up the 222 this way, guess what? Beautiful sandy soil. Septic system laying right in there. So it's so sandy that in Claremont County, they allowed me to put a leach field in there. You say, I don't even know what that means. I tell you this, it's not very common or likely to happen. That's how good the soil was. But that one area is stony. I've tried to grow grass there. But guess what? I don't dig very far, and what happens? A rock. There's a rock. It's shallow. Here we find two ends of the same spectrum as well. It was Satan that was working in the hearts of those who received the word on the wayside. Here we see the flesh. It begins with the joy of when they hear the good news, but they never actually receive it deep enough for it to become truth and take root in their own lives. This joy ends at the other end of the spectrum with what? Discouragement. When things don't go the way they expected them to as a Christian, because of the truth of the gospel, well, that couldn't have been true. That, that was bogus. That's one end of the spectrum. The other one that's shown here through the flesh, when they receive the word, is this. They, they may kneel at an altar with tears running down their face, raising their hands and shouting in the joy of this truth. But emotion is often shallowness. It says that they received it in joy, but it wasn't real. I could take you to places in Africa and all over the world where they'll hoop and holler and shout and scream and sing and have all the joy that you'd ever want to see, but they're as far from God. And they'll do it in the name as they, as they read the Scriptures. Emotion is not what our faith is rooted in. Now, can it be a result of our faith that brings us to tears, that causes us to raise our hand? Absolutely. But we ought to be careful because Satan's an imitator. And there's a shallow, I don't even call it a shallow faith because it's not a faith at all. It's this surface level joy of understanding maybe even the good news that the gospel is, but not accepting it for ourselves. And it never takes root because of all the rocks and other things that are in the way. Then the scripture goes on. We see from religion to atheism, we see from joy to discouragement. Satan behind one, our own flesh behind the other. Just as much as the flesh brings the joy, it's our flesh that brings what? The discouragement when things don't go the way that we expect them to. Yeah. I've never seen people give up on God so quick. Yeah. Faith in Christ and the gospel isn't a, isn't a pill that you take and everything in your life just turns to, to gold. That's right. Sounds a pill that you can take that at first is sweet, but... They can bring about some trials, some hardships, some difficulties. But then we see the thorny soil. It says that there, was not, there wasn't a room for the thorns and the weeds and the seed all to receive nourishment. Here it says, we understand not this to be Satan or the flesh, but the world. It uses an interesting perspective here. What does it say? Did you pick up on it? Because of what? He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this what? This world. And the deceitfulness of what? Riches. You know what the world pushes us towards? We have Satan, we have the flesh, we have the world. We have the wayside, and we have what? The rocky soil and the thorny soil. The world will choke out faith, will choke out the gospel before faith can be received. And it says the deceitfulness of what? What does it say? Riches. Here we see again two ends, opposite ends of the same spectrum. You know what they are? 
riches, and poverty. I believe that sometimes just as difficult it is for a rich man to accept Christ, or as Christ said, it would be more difficult for what? It would be easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle? I think for one that's poor, it can often be difficult as well. The deceit of riches is this. Either I have it all figured out on my own, I've made it this far, I'll be okay. I don't need God. You ever known somebody with that attitude or that spirit? If we're not careful, for those who the Lord is, or for those, well, well in, 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 in a sense, whether saved or lost, any of it's the blessings of the Lord, it rains on the just and the unjust. But that's a, that's a struggle. The Scripture clearly tells us that. I don't need God. I've got everything I need, my own riches, my own ability, my own, my own wealth. But just as difficult as the one who has to say, why would God allow this in my life? If there was a loving God, these things, poverty wouldn't exist. Disease wouldn't exist. We understand those things exist because of the sinfulness of man. Yes. When we look at the scripture, we look at this parable. When we examine, I've heard this taught my entire life. I'm not uh, examining it this week so closely. It's given me a different perspective of the purpose and why. I was really struck by a truth that I ignored many times, and that was the fact that Jesus gave the parable to everyone and gave the explanation to the disciples because it was a spiritual truth. There may be one here this morning. Maybe you're lost in religion. Maybe, maybe that seed of the gospel has been there and you know it. But you think that going to church and doing the outward things is enough. It's not. You know what's another hard, compacting agent? That when, I was, when I was a kid, I said a prayer. Words will not save someone. Faith will save someone. Is our heart more important? Now, ask you this question. If somebody says the sinner's prayer and doesn't mean a word of it, are they saved? What'd they do? They just said words. If you said the sinner's prayer, does that mean that you're not saved? No. If you meant it in your heart and you ask God to save you, then guess what? You're saved. And no one can take that away from you. So it's not the action itself, but it's the condition of the heart that makes the difference. Uh, we've lived uh, close to two generations now where if we could sweep a kid in and get him to say a prayer, we'll send him out the door and put another notch in our belt. Can I tell you that? Can I tell you this? In the same way that I used these words earlier, that's wicked. And that has long-lasting effects that you may never understand. We come to the very end, and we're, uh, I'm done. It says, verse 23, it says, That which also fell on the good ground, right? It said, Bringeth forth fruit, beareth fruit, bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. That's an interesting statement, isn't it? What does that mean? I've heard some very interesting examinations of this passage. I heard somebody one time say, well, some people are just hundredfold Christians, and some are sixtyfold Christians, and some are thirtyfold Christians. That's not what this is saying. There's no degree of Christians. Here's what it does mean when we sow the seed in missions, in preaching, in teaching, in teaching, our, in teaching our Sunday school class, in knocking on doors, in passing out tracts, whatever it might be. You know what we want to see? We want to see the hundredfold, don't we? But you know what sometimes we get? Sometimes we get a hundred. Sometimes we see sixty. Sometimes we see thirty. It's teaching the reality that Paul says as well. 
It says that some may plant and others water, but what? God gives the increase. It's our job simply to do what? Be faithful to sow the seed. Amen. The harvest is not up to us. It's not that if hey, he teaches as well that how we teach what we do, how we say it has an impact, but ultimately it's up to God. A missionary goes to the foreign field and he's in a, a struggling ministry in a closed country and nobody is saved for years. Is he unfaithful to God because he's not seen a hundredfold harvest? If one goes to Sierra Leone and sees thousands of people saved, is one more obedient or better than the other? The truth that's being taught here is when, when it falls on the good ground, it will grow. And that growth itself will even produce what? More fruit. That's the natural process. But we don't have any control over what that's going to be. That's up to God. The harvest is, is the faithfulness of God's people carrying out what He's asked us to do. But it's the God of the harvest. is the one. You know, sometimes... We give the gospel, and there's no response. Sometimes we give the gospel, and somebody accepts Christ. There's times I stand up here and preach, and I think that was the worst thing that anyone has ever had to listen to. And when I'm done, people fill the altars, and I just say, God, thank you for using your word in spite of me. And there's other times in my flesh, if I'm not careful, I can say, man, that was good. And that really affected a lot of people. Nothing. I think God reminds, I think God does that to remind me sometimes 100, sometimes 60, sometimes 30. But Phil, it don't have anything to do with you. It has to do with me, Amen. with my gospel. Every head bowed, every eye closed. No one's looking around. A lot of things to consider. I know